Welcome to the busy Latter-day Saint, where righteous desires and living life come together. Here, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints discuss their challenges and successes in studying the scriptures. I'm your host, Richard Bernard. The music for this program is by Marvin Goldstein and used with his permission. Please give this podcast a thumbs up and tap the subscribe button. Your thumbs up and subscription increase the show's ratings, thus making it easier for people to find. If you have any comments or would like to be a guest on the podcast, feel free to email me. Additionally, if you have someone in mind who would make a great guest, please let me know. To receive updates on the Gospel Library and news about this product, be sure to add your email to my website. I only send emails once a week, and rest assured that your email will not be sold. Links to my email and website are in the show notes. Today's guest is Brad Wilcox, who needs no introduction among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today, Brad and I will talk about technology and the importance of taking charge of how we use it and cautioning parents that they're not walking the talk about technology. And while discussing the use of technology, Brad coins a new phrase, sacrament rage. And of course, we discuss how he studies the scriptures by connecting with current events and explains the three levels of scripture study and this and much, much more. Now, this is just part one of my interview with Brad in two weeks. There will be part two when we discuss the importance of journaling and the impact journaling has on our lives. And now, here's Brad. Brad, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for the what you're doing with the podcast. I think this is a very needed uh, podcast because I don't know many Latter-day Saints who are not busy. So thank you for helping us figure out how we can fit our study into a busy life. Well, I appreciate that. And um, occasionally I do get feedback from people that say they actually enjoy the podcast. And more importantly, they learn because the podcast is about how members of the church study the scriptures. And I've learned there's so many different ways. But uh, we will get into that. Now, I see you're in a tie. So uh, in our um, uh, pre-podcast here, I noticed your tie and you said you've been busy working. (laughs) Yeah, I've already been in a lot of meetings today, but (laughs) but always happy to, to stop for a minute and talk about the scriptures. I love that. Well, now, what time do you start your morning? Oh, it gets, uh, it depends on the day. Summers get kind of busy for us because we're working with uh, For the Strength of Youth conferences. And uh, so sometimes I'm up early to travel to a conference. Sometimes, like this morning, we were up early to talk about some some uh, uh, issues. And one of the people was in Europe who was on our meeting and one I was here in Utah, and there were others from different parts of the country where different For the Strength of Youth conferences are happening. So, so yeah, I don't know if I have a regular wake-up time because it kind of varies. (laughs) Yeah, I understand that. I did a podcast, well, no, I did a devotional in Korea on Zoom, and they're on a totally different day. (laughs) I, and I, I, I think I was up at four o'clock in the morning or something and, and uh, be able to have that devotional for them. Well, before I forget, I saw a picture of you. It was a few months ago, but I was greatly impressed because you ran a marathon or a half a marathon or a quarter <laughs> yeah, of a marathon. I don't know. <laughs> it was a half marathon and uh, it is evidence that fathers will do anything for their children. That's what it is. <laughs> well, my question is, when is your next marathon? <laughs> oh, now you're sounding like one of my children. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was funny. My uh, I, my son uh, called and said, Dad, I'm doing a half marathon. And I said, great, I'll be there to cheer for you. And he said, my, 
he says, Whitney, my daughter and, and her husband are going to do it too. And I said, great, I'll cheer for you. And he said, and you're going to do it too. And I said, whoa, I said, that's, a, that's not going to happen. And he said, dad, pray about it. And, <laughs> and so I prayed about it. And yeah, God told me probably a smart thing for this guy to do. So, so yeah, <laughs> we, we trained for it and did it at the beginning of this summer and it was a very good experience with my children, and it was a good experience for me. And how did you train for that? Oh, just a lot of running. Uh, and uh, and I'm just grateful that we can listen to things while we run, because then that way I don't feel like I'm throwing all that time out the window. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I try to go for a walk every morning. I've given up running. I used to run. But I'm a little bit older than you, so. <laughs> well, I don't know if you could call what I do running. It's oh, <laughs> kind of, it's kind of a kind of a slow jog, and you know most people can walk faster than I can run. Oh, okay, but at least I'm out there, and that's good. <laughs> well, it was a great picture of you going through the finish line, and um, I thought, wow, I'm impressed. Well, you mentioned your children. How many children do you have? We've got four, four kids, um, three are married. We've got nine grandchildren and it's, uh, it just is, takes a lot of time to keep up with, with, uh, with family. I'm blessed that I have a wife who is so devoted and dedicated to the family and also to making sure that I don't get too busy to spend time with family and to be there with the family um it's uh it's been a blessing through the years that she kind of pulls me back when i start getting a little too busy and so even yesterday i got to go out and watch my my grandkids while while my daughter was doing a little a uh, gospel study class with some sisters in her ward and uh and it was good it was good to be able to just be there with the kids. I love to read to them. And I've got a little granddaughter who's just getting excited about books. And so it's fun to sit and read to her and and uh, read the same book over and over and over again. And she always gets as, as, as excited about what's happening in the book and, and as she was the first time we read it. So, so a big thank you to my wife who helps make sure that the family doesn't get shafted in a busy. Well, you mentioned grandchildren. You have nine. Um, I have you beat a little bit. I think I have 34. Holy smoke. You know what? <laughs> My dad used to say, it's amazing how much damage two people can do in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, w what I discovered is that um, grandchildren are much more fun than children, so I wish I'd have had them first. <laughs> but um, yes, it's uh, in fact, I have honestly, I if you lined them all up, I don't think I can give the name of every single one. That's what's embarrassing with me. Um, well, your wife will have to pull you in and and make sure you learn those. <laughs> well, she, she, she helps me, and she she knows because of my dyslexia, I have certain problems, and so she's well aware of them, and so um, she'll remind me. <laughs> and uh, so it's that's that's how I do it. And of course, we have four great grandchildren. So, oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, the it, it, it's always grandma's house. It's always grandma's. Uh, party. It's always about grandma. And yes. At yep. First, yep. I kind of resented that, <laughs> but now I'm just so grateful for the relationship that grandma has with those kids, and through her, the relationship that she helps me maintain. Yes. Uh, when I go to family gatherings, I'm the least important person there. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of humbling. <laughs> and sometimes I tell my wife, I, I don't even really need to go <laughs> because it's it's all about her. And you're right. Um, I'm so grateful for my wife, and um, and uh, of course this is my second marriage. That's why we have so many children. 
Um, my first marriage, we had four, and uh, through Amy, we had five. One thing I've noticed, uh, Richard, is that as the kids get older, uh, it's interesting that that uh, grandpas, dads, start taking on a more important role in their lives. Um, and so even though we're joking about how it's all about grandma, we've got to remember that um, both grandpas and grandmas, both moms and dads are needed and play important roles in the in the children's development and different roles in how children uh, interact with others and interact with the world and uh, and they need both. Um, there's a fascinating study. Let me grab this so I can that I was just reading uh, by Janet Jacob Erickson, a professor at BYU. She says it takes two. What we learn from social science about the divine pattern of gender complementary, uh, com complementary. Oh, I don't. I, I'll just say you can edit that. Uh, her study says it takes two. What we learn from social science about the divine pattern of gender and how genders complement each other in parenting. Well, that's a powerful statement. Well, I'd like to learn more about you. Where did you grow up? I actually grew up in Ethiopia, Africa. My dad was uh, starting some education programs over there and trying to improve the quality of education. And so my earliest childhood memories uh, begin in Africa. We moved back to the United States when I was just about to turn eight. I was baptized here in the United States, but my earliest memories are of Africa. Then my dad was a professor at BYU, so we lived here in Provo and, uh, and then uh, served my mission in Chile and then came back and have been generally in Provo except for times when we have been away for studies. I got my PhD at the University of Wyoming and also uh, times when we've directed study abroad. Uh, we took some students down to New Zealand and lived there for about six months, one year. We also had the same chance to do that in Spain. And uh, those have been really rich, wonderful experiences. Uh, served as mission leaders in Chile again. And so I've spent five years of my life serving as a missionary in Chile. And so we've had some rich international experiences, but home has been Provo because of my work at BYU. Well, you mentioned Chile. We have a grandson that's going to Chile to serve a mission. Oh, uh, he's going to love it. I think he goes out September or October. What I'm trying to do with my grandchildren as they serve, prepare to serve missions, is I want to study the gospel with them, uh, to, you know, until they they leave, and teach them about the importance and teach them how to study the scriptures. And yeah. so I, I haven't set that up. I've got two going on missions. Um, uh, Chile and Brazil, if I remember right. Um, <clears throat> And well, your but, family's making a contribution in South America. That's wonderful. Yes, yeah. So we're we're excited that they're going. So, but okay. So we pretty much covered your your life here and summed it up all in two minutes. <laughs> 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 and uh, of course, you're a well-known speaker throughout the church. And I, I have to ask, um, you're now serving as the first counselor in. The general presidency of the young men. I probably got that title wrong backwards, but that's okay. Um, when that call came, how does it come? Um, I was called in 2020 when they reorganized the young men general presidency, and I was called as the second counselor. This call came when uh, Ahmed Corbett, who was serving as the first counselor, was called to the to the uh, to be a general authority seventy. And uh, 
he will do a wonderful job. He will bless so many lives. And uh, we miss working with him on a day on a close basis. But we're very grateful. The man who was serving as the executive secretary in our presidency, Mike Nelson, was called as the second counselor. And so he's been great. And he already was up to speed with everything that we've got going, all the balls we've got in the air. And uh, and he's just been able to pick right up and just keep running with us. So it's uh, it's been a smooth transition. And of course, I feel very blessed to work with President Steve Lund. He's uh, inspired and uh, very uh, warm and genuine man. His interactions with the youth are always just incredible. So we also are working very closely with the young women presidency. That hasn't always been the case in the church because the young men have been focused on scouting and the young women on their personal progress program. And so finally, since children and youth became the program of the church, we're working regularly. We meet almost weekly with the Young Women General Presidency. And uh, and so they're going through a transition now, too. We're having to say goodbye to Bonnie Corden and her counselors. They've been such a joy to work with. And we're looking forward to working at the beginning of August is when they officially will uh, take, you know, they, they'll officially begin their service. And we look forward to working with Emily Freeman and her counselors. Um, but it's been a great relationship. And I think a model for how we hope stake young women presidencies and stake young men presidencies are working together, how Bishop Bricks and uh, young women presidencies of the ward are working together. Um, because we've seen so many positive things come out of the out of that synergy that happens as we're working together to try to bless the youth. Well, I see the program growing, and I think it's it's, it's exciting news. Um, um, the um, preach my gospel um, book has been updated and. Um, I am uh, very familiar with the book. I probably have studied 75 to 80% of it. Uh, my wife and I served a mission at the MTC where we helped missionaries study the scriptures that had various reading problems and things. And so I really had to know, preach my gospel. And I was very excited about um, the technology section. Um, that's always a, a great concern of mine. In fact, um, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, you recently you see it came out in the church news new resources teaches youth about technology yeah and that's very connected to preach my gospel because the the missionary department has had something called safeguards for using technology some principles that guide missionary time and decisions when it comes to technology um, but they've never been right in preach my gospel and now they're right there in Preach My Gospel. We have spent the last few years adapting that those safeguards for using technology and trying to create something that can be used with youth, especially young people, older primary children, um, young people as they enter the youth program, many of them at age 11. Uh, we wanted something that would be uh, applicable to them and also communicated in a way that they could understand. And so finally, uh, not only is our safeguards for technology in Preach My Gospel, but finally we have what we're calling taking charge of technology, and it's actually in the Gospel Library now. So you can go there and under youth, you can find taking charge of technology it's a series of short lessons and animated videos that the youth respond to very positively. Um, these videos were done not just to inform parents and leaders, but so that they could be something shown directly to youth that then could be discussed. And I think you'll be pleased with the videos. The whole 
thing revolves around three general principles. We're trying to teach youth to use technology with a purpose, to not simply go on their phones uh, when they're bored and just scroll and scroll and scroll. We want them to establish a purpose. We also want them to be able to plan uh, and, and, and go on technology with something that they want to accomplish. And then finally, we want them to know how they can pause when they start feeling uncomfortable, when they start being exposed to something that's not positive, we want them to know how to pause and then be able to make some decisions about whether to continue or not um, and what to do in those moments. So I think parents will find that these are going to be helpful principles and this will be a valuable tool for helping youth real realize that Technology does not control them. Right. They can control technology. And anybody who has 34 grandchildren, did you say, Richard, uh, needs to, to be able to talk to youth about this. Yes. Because those grandchildren, some of them handle technology better than others. And for many, uh, it's a wall. It's an escape. They don't want to interact with people. They feel anxious about that. So automatically the phone comes up and we've got to be able to help them know and help families establish no device times and no device zones so that they know that there are certain rooms in the house, bedrooms uh, and uh, bathrooms where no devices are allowed, no device times, being able to put devices away uh, at bedtime so that it's not interrupting sleep and and no device uh, experiences like family meals where we don't have screens, we don't have TV going on in the background and that it will allow children the chance to develop their technology skills, use the tool wisely, but not lose the personal interactions and the social skills that are absolutely so important. You know, the research, Richard, says that, you know, young people, <clears throat> this is not just an issue for young people in the church. This is an issue uh, internationally. And the researchers have shown that just since 2007, when the iPhone was first released, we saw a dramatic shift in the fact that young people are hanging out less with their friends. They're in no rush to date or to drive. They are less likely to get enough sleep and they are reporting higher levels of depression and loneliness and they claim that they are less happy and don't know how to be happy. And all of that just since the onset of the iPhone in 2007. So hopefully this tool will be useful as we help youth take charge of technology. Well, I'm familiar with that in the Gospel Library since I'm one of the experts on it and I work with the developers and I have all the alpha versions of it. And those videos are very good. I, the minute they came out, I took a look at them. I, in our preparation for this podcast, I told you that in my devotionals, I talk about technology is here to hasten the Lord's work. And as I study it more and more, I am so concerned when I, what I see with the youth and with these devices. If I was raising a family, I, they would not be in their hands. In fact, I was listening to a podcast while I was um, shaving and taking a shower. <laughs> and um, it was actually um, about this, this issue. And one of the uh, podcasters says he calls them screen teens. And I thought, what a, a great phrase, because how true. And the problem is also with the adults. I, st I, I still remember going to Costco, and there were two women, and they I didn't know if they were sisters or a mother and daughter, and the mother was just looking very young. But they had about a 
two-year-old, I guess, sitting in the, um, the seat there. And one woman was pushing the cart, and the other woman was holding um, a, a mini iPad so that the child could watch a movie. And I thought, what damage is being done? That child's not learning to be bored. He's not learning to communicate. He's not learning to shop. <clears throat> now, in my days when I raised children, we didn't have digital devices and we went shopping. That was an exercise to learn how to shop and, and how to read and, and how to weigh things. And all of this is being taken away from them. And uh, I just, I, I'm concerned and... And the other part my concern is, is that um, how it's being handled in the church. One of the biggest things that people approach me with throughout the country is how do I control these devices in the classroom and church? And I have definite things that can help and, and I work with them on that. But a lot of adults are just overcome and so they say, well, don't bring the devices. But I said, that doesn't solve the problem the the problem is they've got to learn there there was a survey done about a few years ago and the big thing that came out of that survey was that the teenagers were saying and these weren't just lds teenagers the teenagers were saying you the parents tell us everything we shouldn't do with these devices but you never tell us what we can do and if I, if I was raising a family, I would have probably four times a year a family home evening just on technology. I think the other thing that you need to remember is that, is that many of the adults are not modeling the very things that they're asking youth to do because they are also misusing that technology and using the technology at the wrong time and in the wrong place. And so it's a problem for all of us. But we got to focus on the we've got to focus on the fact that that it's put the scriptures right in the hands of all of us at all times. And that is a blessing. It's put general conference talks right in our hands. Uh, we don't have to wait for the Leahona to come out. We don't have to wait until it's a lesson in church we can be reviewing this material and studying this material all the time. So the very tool that has has uh, brought a lot of dangerous and negative material into our circle has also brought a lot of wonderful material. And isn't that what we're told about the last days? Is yes. that there will be a fullness of light and there will be a fullness of darkness. And so we just have to focus on the light. And we have to help young people be able to know that the scripture tools that are available to them through technology are what previous generations and even previous prophets in past generations would have given anything to have. So we want to continue to focus on teaching, training, helping uh, young people discover and use the scriptures um, that are so easily accessible. Yes, and you're absolutely right. We have to model. When I'm at a family gathering, I don't pull my phone out. Um, I might pull it out to take a photo. I might take it out to show a photo. <laughs> or sometimes somebody comes and asks me because I'm the geek in the family, how does this app work? So I do that. But normally it just stays in my pocket. And um, it breaks my heart when I'm in sacrament meeting and I see somebody texting. And it's an adult. Um, now, I have certain problems with this because... Um, when I go to sacrament meeting, I have my digital device. Well, first of all, my all my digital devices are set up. I use Apple for everything. So that when Sunday comes, I'm limited to what apps I can use. I've set that up. And my screensaver is a picture of the Savior to remind me this is Sunday. And my watch has a picture of the Savior. And so I'm constantly being reminded on Sunday, this is Sunday. <laughs> And I just limit the apps that I, I want to have access to. But also, this is the way I take notes when I receive inspiration. 
my journal is with me all the time, but I'm using digital de devices. And so if my phone is open or if my iPad's open um, during sacrament meeting, it's because I've received some inspiration and I've got to get it down or I'm going to lose it. But and, and we have to give each other that benefit of the doubt. We have to be able to say when we see an adult texting during sacrament meeting, we just have to, we have to just, you know, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. We've yeah. got to just give somebody the benefit of the doubt and right. say, well, maybe he's jotting down an inspiration he's had. Maybe he's do, doing a quick text because he just thought of somebody because of what the speaker said and he wanted to send a positive text. I, I just find I have to do in sacrament meeting the same thing I do on the road. When I see somebody driving and they're texting or they're they're putting on makeup in the rearview mirror <laughs> at the same time they're driving on the freeway, I just have to smile and I have to say, all right, Brad, just be understanding, be patient, and just remember that, you know, you don't know all the circumstances in that person's life. And so I, I just, uh, that helps me from feeling road rage or Am I coining a new term here? Sacrament meeting rage? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I just try to remember that everybody is in different circumstances and different levels of spiritual maturity. And that helps me to not get too uptight about it. Well, I was at a devotional. I don't remember where, but a bishop came up to me and said, I have a problem. And I thought, well, that's for the stake president to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, no, um, he says, I used to use my phone during sacrament meeting because he says, that's where I read the sacrament prayer. And he says, and that's where I make my notes. But I had several members come up to me when I was first called as a bishop and said that I need to repent because you're, you're using your phone during sacrament meeting. And he said, what should I do? And I said, well, I would meet with those people and explain what you just explained and also say I'm using it for the Lord's work. And so now what you said about driving, and we're going to be talking about the scriptures here in a minute. My study of the scriptures daily has gotten me to the point, and I hope this doesn't sound like bragging, but I don't worry about the other drivers. I don't think, oh, that was stupid, or what are you thinking? I just let it go, because you're right, I don't know their circumstances. And I think you've brought up a very valid point and an important one, that in sacrament meeting we have to do the same thing. And I think I need to repent a little bit, because sometimes I'm in sacrament meeting and I see somebody playing a game that's not even no. texting they're playing a game and they're an adult and i'm just going what are you doing it's the sacrament <laughs> but i'm going to repent and see if i can get more um i'm not have that sacrament rage as you as you pointed out <laughs> <laughs> well let's get into studying the scriptures um how do you study the scriptures um, I found that both in my family, when the children were younger, and uh, now, my time is best spent if I try to connect my study with something else that I'm already doing. Rather than waking up early for, for a devotional and have all the children there reading the scriptures, I know some families that can make that work. But that never worked for us. But we always ate breakfast. And so breakfast became the time that we were reading the scriptures. That became the time when I was reading to the children. Um, as the kids got older and into high school, then uh, we had carpools. We'd be going around picking up kids for carpools. And uh, I just would play the scriptures. I'd say, all right, everybody. I said, as we're going to school today, we're going to be listening to 1 Nephi chapter 15. And I would just say, we're already in the car. We're already spending this time. Let's uh, kill two birds with one stone. And and it's funny because now uh, that my kids are older, 
and some of those carpool kids are older, that's what they always remember. They say, I remember you always reading the scriptures to us at breakfast, or I remember you always would make us listen to scriptures on our way to school. And I, uh, I think even now in my life, I will often listen to scriptures or conference talks while I'm driving, or I'll listen to a book, a recorded book while I'm driving. I also will use my shower time. At BYU, I ask the youth to memorize some scriptures during the semester. And all of them say, I'm too busy for that. I'm too busy for that. And I say, do you shower? Yeah. I said, well, don't tell me if you, if it's no, because you don't want to admit that. So yeah, you're showering. And if you've got time to shower, you've got time to memorize some scriptures. So right now in my showers, I'm working on the Aaronic Priesthood Quorum theme in Spanish. So I start my shower and I just start saying, Soy un amado hijo de Dios y él tiene una obra para mí. Con todo mi corazón, alma, mente y fuerza. And I just start going through it in the shower. And so that will give me a chance to review scriptures, to memorize scriptures. I just, if you saw my shower, you'd laugh because up on the sides are high enough that the water doesn't reach them. I've got all these scriptures and all these things that I've, I'm trying to review. That way I... I'm using time that is already gone. Shower time is already gone. So instead of trying to carve out new time in my life, oh, I'm going to wake up a half hour early every morning. I already told you, some mornings for me start at 3 a.m. Some mornings I get to sleep until 7. I, I don't, my life and schedule get so busy that I can't carve out a set time every day. Uh, and I think many Latter-day Saints would relate to that. So what I try to do is connect my study to something I'm already doing. And that way, I'm getting the regularity, the consistency that I need to be able to be feeding my spirit. And then there are, are some days when I can sit down and go more in depth, especially as I'm preparing things I'm going to teach preparing things I'm writing, preparing things I'm sharing. That's another way that I've connected my study to my life. Because instead of just studying to study and check it off my list, I study to say, all right, how could I share this? How could I incorporate this in my work with the youth? How can I incorporate this into my lessons I'm teaching at BYU? And so that gives me a purpose besides just self-enrichment that, that keeps me studying and it keeps my study alive. And so that might not work for people. Maybe some people have a wonderful cabin. They can go and take retreats at their cabin and they can just immerse themselves in the scriptures. I don't have a cabin. I don't have a time to take a retreat. I just have to fit it in to a life in which I'm already juggling a lot of balls. And so I just make it, uh, I make it part of other things that I'm doing, part of my life. I'm going to be preparing some talks anyway. So why can't I connect my study to the talks I'm preparing? And the more I do that, the more I find my scripture study to be consistent and uh, it can be meaningful, but it doesn't take additional time that I just don't have. If I listen to your podcast, Richard, I'll tell you this, it will never be just sitting down and listening to your podcast. It will be while I'm fixing a meal. It will be while I'm mowing the lawn. It, I, I, I will never take time to sit down and say, what does Richard say today? I, I, I don't have time for that. <laughs> but I got to mow the lawn anyway. So, Richard, you're going to be joining me mm -hmm. when I'm mowing the lawn. I have in my mind a picture, and I'm actually looking. Uh, the title is 
do the right W-R-I-T-E thing that shows a picture each of the uh, general presidency of the young men. And you are there, looks like in your office, and uh, you're writing in a journal, and you've got this, what I'd call a missionary copy of the Book of Mormon that, that's passed out, you know, the, the very inexpensive ones. And that looks like it's been all marked up, and it's got post-it notes, and, <laughs> and, and you're writing. Now, is that part of your normal study? Yes, very much so. Um, they caught me sitting at my desk, but it doesn't always happen at my desk but it does include writing. I found that if I'm just reading the scriptures, it's easy for me to fall asleep. It's easy for my mind to wander. But if I'm writing about what I'm reading, if I'm responding to what I'm reading, then my mind never wanders. I stay focused. I comprehend better. I remember better. Now, sometimes that writing happens in a journal. Um, my life journal and my study journal are one in the same. I don't use a different journal when I'm taking notes at general conference or a different journal when I'm taking notes at sacrament meeting. Uh, and I don't, uh, you know, I just write about what I'm reading in my journal. And I write about what I'm studying in the scriptures, some of the insights that have come, some of the questions that have come, some of the connections I've made with with uh with life experiences and people in my life this reminds me of my ex my experience with so and so and so i do a lot of writing and some of the writing is in a journal and some of the writing is just on scratch paper when i'm in the parking lot after having listened to something while i've been driving and then i throw those scrap pieces of papers inside my cheap copies of the scriptures and i write all over those scriptures you you would not want to see my scriptures because they're not pretty i don't mark them carefully i don't color code them i have shelves and shelves of copies of the new testament copies of the book of mormon and i will i don't even study them by theme i just as i'm reading a section I write all over it. Now, I love the wide margin journal edition copies. I love those and I use them. But I also just use those cheap ones, the inexpensive ones, the ones. And I just write all over the page. I don't just stay in the margins. I just write all over the page. Um, because then as I'm standing up using that, I don't have to go from the scriptures to my study journal, I don't have to, I just have it all right there in my scriptures. And so when I'm giving a talk, I'll have a script, I'll have a book of scripture that's just for that talk. And so instead of having a teleprompter or instead of having uh, e an outline, I just have the outline written in my scriptures. So then I stand up at a youth conference or I stand up for a sacrament meeting talk and I just have my little beat up copy of the scriptures uh that has my talk on happiness and then i just open it up and i've got it all right there written in my scriptures and then i can go from my scriptures to my experiences so quickly and so easily when we read we're bringing what's outside of us inside of us but when we write when we verbalize we're bringing what's inside out. Now, would you ever expect somebody to call himself literate if all he did were to listen and read? No, that's all coming in. That's all coming in. The real learning and the internalization of what we're learning happens as we're bringing it out. That can be a discussion like we have in a sacrament meeting or in a Sunday school class. Um, it can be a, a discussion with a spouse about a gospel topic in the scriptures or an insight that's come. But it can also be just bringing it out in a journal. 
Uh, and then that way, I'm getting a balanced literacy and I'm getting a balanced life because it's not just what we take in, but it's what we bring out. And that helps us to have a complete experience with learning and not just a one-sided experience. Yes, I, I agree. And just for the listeners, we're actually, Brad and I are going to have another podcast just on journaling. And I'm excited about that one. And that'll be yeah, at a Richard, you and I are pretty crazy to say <laughs> that we're excited about journaling because not many people are. But I tell you, I'm excited about it. And it's, it's definitely part of my life. Well, uh, the listeners need to know that there'll be a separate podcast with just journaling. and But the idea came from you because you and I were walking next to each other, going to our respective cars. And, and um, we had already talked about journaling. And you said we should have a podcast just on journaling. And I go, what? I would have never thought of that. That's a fantastic idea. Okay, let's do it. (laughs) Good. Well, we will. But journaling might turn a lot of people off. But if you realize that journaling can be part of your scripture study, then that might turn a lot of people on. Yes, I I agree. And I've, I've helped other people to start journaling. And they always come back to me a year later, two years later, and they say, it has changed my life. And so journaling is very, very important. Well, we've talked about how you study the scriptures. And um, I, I guess I just have one last question, and then we'll end here. Um, I'm assuming you've read the first um, chapter of First Nephi probably a thousand times. And um, I know most members of the church have read that first chapter. And of course, as Elder Bednar says, most people stop right where Isaiah starts. And then they put the Book of Mormon back up on the shelf. Um, and I don't understand that because I, I get excited with Isaiah. But anyway, if you are reading, well, let me get some background. I, I had a wonderful interview with uh, Susan Easton Black, and I was there in her office in her I home. I love her. Yeah, she's wonderful. And I asked her at one point, I said, look, you know the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> that, that's a given. When you study the, go- the gospel and you're in the Doctrine and Covenants, what do you do? I mean, you know it. <laughs> and she's got a photographic memory. And her response was so wonderful. She says, I stop and ask the Lord, what is it that I still don't know? Mm, Beautiful. Yes. And so I'm asking you, when you uh, read that first chapter of 1 Nephi, and it says, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents for the thousandth time, what do you do? Nyla Benton Smith was a literacy expert Uh, She's not a member of the church, but she uh, proposed a way to help children and young people as they're learning to read, to be able to not just decode the words, but to be able to really comprehend what they're reading. And she talked about reading the lines but then reading between the lines and then reading beyond the lines. And I, I, those three things have been something I often will share with my students when it comes to reading in the scriptures, because maybe sometimes you're just reading the lines and that's important. If somebody's not reading the scriptures at all, I need them to start by just reading the lines and reading what's there. But when you're returning to scriptures over and over, then you want to start reading between the lines. You want to start reading beyond the lines. Um, If you're looking at 1 Nephi, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, well, we think we know what that means until you stop and say, first of all, I, Nephi, Who talks like that? 
we certainly don't talk like that in English. So is this Joseph Smith just writing this? Or was there really a person named Nephi who's speaking another language and writing in another language? And we see evidences of that language in English. The Book of Mormon. That's how we say it in Spanish. El Libro de Mormon. It's perfect in Spanish, but that's not how we say it in English. In English, it would be Mormon's book. Mormon's book. So why isn't it Mormon's book? Do we see preserved in the translation we're given in English evidence that this is coming from a different language, a different culture? Now that's reading between the lines. Having been born of goodly parents. Wow. Um, goodly parents. His parents must have been super nice. No. Maybe we start reading between the lines and saying, is Nephi explaining why it is that he can read and write in a world that is completely illiterate? Maybe goodly parents means parents with goods, parents who are wealthy. Maybe he's explaining, as ancient scribes did, why he can read and write. And, and maybe he was saying, my parents were wealthy. That's how come I wasn't out scrounging for my next meal. I was able to get an education. And if we start reading between the lines, then we can start getting more out of the scriptures. The third part of that pattern is to read beyond the lines. And that means connect it to you. Um, what opportunities do I have because of the opportunities for literacy and education that my parents have given me? And then I, I start saying he was taught somewhat in the language of his fathers. And I think, so what have I been taught? by parents and parent figures in my life. I could I could go on for a long time and say, when did my parents' words sink deep into my heart the same way that Enos's father's words sank deep into his heart? When have my parents taught me something that has been meaningful and that I would want to teach to my children and grandchildren. Now, most people wouldn't think about that as they're reading 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. But those are some of the things that I think about. Now, do I expect children in primary to be able to do that? No. But I do expect those who have revisited the Book of Mormon multiple times to stop saying Oh my gosh, this is so boring. I mean, I've read it a million times and now I'm just <laughs> reading it again. I want them to be able to say, maybe it's time that I read through a new lens. Maybe this time I start reading between the lines, beyond the lines. Maybe this is a time when I start making connections, not just between this scripture and other scriptures, but between the scriptures and my life and the lives of those I love. And that way, you never can read the Book of Mormon too many times. That way, it always has relevance and always has significance. Thank you. You just did me a great favor. Um, when I give my devotionals, I do turn to that first verse, and I do explain these things. Um, I say, why does he start with I first Nephi when he just above in the explanation said, I Nephi wrote this record. And now he's saying, I Nephi? Well, I learned over some study that that's the way kings wrote and that he was considered a king by his people. He wasn't actual king, but people looked at him as a king. I spent a week on that word goodly. 
And I came to the same conclusion that you just talked about, that they had the means to provide him because I actually did research on what the literacy rate was at the time now. How these PhDs came to that conclusion, I don't know. That's beyond my under comprehension. But it was like 2% literacy. And so. Well, people who could read and write had titles, Richard. Yes. Titles like scribe. Yes. I mean, because it was so rare for them to be able to read and write and speak other languages. Yes, absolutely. And so, what you helped me with, though, is you put in, and I made a note here, you, you expressed it beautifully what I try to teach during the devotional, so I'm going to steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, what, that's and, what we do. And, and, that's not stealing, that's called learning. Yes, and so I'm going to talk about reading the line, reading in between, and reading beyond. And I'll, I'll give you full credit. <laughs> no, give Nyla Benton Smith full credit. But um, that's what I teach because I go to Isaiah. I love Isaiah. And I go to usually chapter 53. And we study that together. And I try to get people to be on the line. And I try to get people. I love what Bed, Elder Bednar said. What is it you heard that wasn't said? And exactly. That's between the lines. That's between the lines, yes. I mean, in Mosiah 319, it says, put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Well, that's easy to read that yep. phrase. Yep. But that there's a lot that's not being said there about how do I put off the natural man? How do I become a saint through the atonement of Christ? Boy, there's so much there between the lines that I have to understand so that that phrase becomes truly meaningful in my life. Well, at the beginning of the year, or maybe it was the last part of last year, I was struggling with um, DNC 119, I think it is. Anyway, it said to remove yourself from Babylon. And I go, okay, I feel that I'm living in Babylon, even though I'm here in Utah. <laughs> but how do I do that? I'm surrounded by it. And I thought about it for two, three weeks. And I was finally, the Lord directed me to a, a great article by Brother Ballard's father. It's a seminal talk given in 1923, I think. And he talks about me and the it. And I won't go into all of it here, but um, that's where I started connecting with me. If I'm asked to leave Babylon, how do I do it? And I gradually got an answer over two or three weeks. And I think that's a key thing with studying the scriptures. The answers don't always come immediately with the light and an angel coming and telling me what to do. And that, but, but as we immerse ourselves in these revelations, and that's what conference talks are, that's what the scriptures are. In many cases, this is revelation that was received by prophets. And as I immerse myself in revelation, then that's one of the best ways to open myself to personal revelation. And so that's why so many people can report hearing him as they're reading the scriptures. Because it's not just what the scripture is telling them, but it's how the scripture is opening their heart to be able to seek personal revelation, like how do I get out of Babylon when I can't leave physically? And, and that's when those revelations come that truly start making a difference in our lives and the lives of those we love. So yes, Richard, I am so grateful for what you're doing to teach people how to study the scriptures because it's not an academic pursuit. It's a spiritual pursuit. It's a, it's a foundation on which we stand to receive personal revelation. And that sets it apart from Bible scholars who claim to be atheists. Yeah, you can have an academic approach and it won't affect your life or choices. But we want scripture study to be something that 
does affect our lives and affect our choices. Yes. And I think that's what God wants for us. Yes, as one woman told me, it was about a year after I gave a devotional, she wrote to me and she says, I want you to know I decided to take the challenge and study the scriptures daily and follow your guidelines, or whatever we want to call them. And um, she says, I just want you to know it has changed my life and I can't wait until every morning to study and open those scriptures. And those who are listening to that and feeling overwhelmed or feeling like, well, that I could never do that. This lady has time in the morning to do that. I don't. Remember, you all shower. <laughs> Use that shower time. And then you can say like this lady, I look forward to that time in the scriptures, even if it's just reading a few verses that I posted in my shower yes. or reciting a few memorized verses. Yes. Yeah. I actually listen to podcasts in my shower. Most people don't know these new iPhones are pretty much waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it on a shelf where it doesn't get too much water, but uh, sometimes I listen to a podcast in the shower. Well, Brad, I want to thank you for joining me. It's It's been a delight. And uh, like I said, I've learned something uh, and I always enjoy learning new things. Uh, as always, I end this podcast with inviting you to share your testimony. Oh, thank you. I think the testimony that I would share today, based on what we've been discussing, is that I know that it's through the scriptures that we can come to know and see and follow and be led by Jesus Christ. Elder Bednar is adamant that we don't speak of the temple without also speaking in the same breath about Jesus. We want people to know that the temple is all about our connection with the Savior. And I think the same can be said about scriptures. As we focus on the scriptures as a way of drawing closer to Christ, learning how he lives so that we can emulate him, seeking the power that he has promised, the grace that he has promised, so that we can be changed and become more like him, then the scriptures will always, always be a priority for us. If we look at the scriptures as just a history or as just a task to do, then it's easy to push them to the side. But if we see the scriptures as how we connect with Jesus Christ, the window through which we see him and come to know him, then we will seek that experience more and more. I know the Savior because of the scriptures, because of the testimony of modern prophets in our day. I love the Savior because of the experiences that I read about him in Scripture. And I can imagine him and his interactions with me because I know his interactions with the woman at the well. I know his interactions with Joseph Smith. I know his interactions with Peter, and I see what he said about his apostles and what they what he taught them. And because of that, then I can seek those same interactions in my mind's eye. I can see him interacting with me in a similar way. And because of that, then I can feel closer to him. And he becomes a force in my life. 95% of the humans on this planet believe in God, but they don't know him enough that that belief makes a difference in their choices, in their behavior, in their day-to-day -day life. 
And that's what the scriptures and the prophets do for us. They help us come to know the Savior, not just know about Him, but know Him. And then that affects my life in positive ways. Then that changes me forever. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.